been starting the stream. I'm like on the game. I'm just out of control. There'll be a technical problem, I'm sure of it. Is it really almost October? That is just crazy. That seems unlikely. just added the uh, the link to the video uh, to the fall schedule <clears throat> so that's updated and dropped it in the chat and we're streaming and it's 530 <laughs> incredible I am in, I'm feeling incredible today how are you guys doing <laughs> I hope you're feeling as well as I do right now, because I feel incredible. Um, okay, let me see. And Devin, you're, you, you're here. Um, oh, you've already got your thing going. Yeah, let me do the Devin stream. Actually, if I double click on Devin, pops his out. Yeah, I'll throw Devin over here. And make that full screen, Mr. Devin. All right, and then I should be able, all right, there we go. Okay, all right. Okay, all right, we ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. We're talking cringely. We're going. We're going back to the well on cringely. We're not done. We're not done with cringely. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. You know what, Devin? I'm actually looking. Is that the start? Is that the five minute mark on that video too? Yeah, it's the five minute mark. Did we get all the way to the end with Grace Hopper? Did we talk about that? I don't. I don't think we did. We must have paused it somewhere. Anyway, we'll kick in with this. Anyway, uh, hey, welcome everybody. Um, uh, for everybody rolling in late, apologize for being on time and rocking the world. But you know, I promised I was going to get better at this whole thing, and I don't think I've even screwed anything up right now, which is just stunning, staggering performance. Okay, so. I finished grading all the current event one. I've been through with Devin and Tim. They are wrapping through a couple things. And then when, Devin? This weekend, Devin and Tim are going to start grading the smallest blog posts. Um, I just, is that, that's right, isn't it, Devin? Kind of ballpark timing. Yo, Devin. Yeah, what was that? Yeah, no, so you and Tim are going to start kicking into grading the smallest blog posts. Like, yeah, we will. Like, it's, it's soon, middle of this week, middle to end of this week. We know we're yeah. behind. We know we're behind. And the way we're going to do this for now is until we catch up, um, I'm just going to continually allow you to refine your blog posts. 
So if you posted it, you don't like it, you want to go back, you want to edit a little more, and it hasn't been graded, do it. Um, if it's been graded, and I'm like, one typo, that's four points. Go back, fix the typo, get the five. All I ask is that you do a resubmit on the assignment so that that's the trigger. You know what I mean? And there's like, what, what is the, what's the head count? 67, Devin? What did we decide? It was something like... The, the head count is 61 61 students. of students? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a lot. And we know we're like way behind. Um, so I appreciate the patience. Um, and we in turn uh, bequeath and bestow upon you also patience. Uh, and uh, the goal, like I said last time, was let's just be better writers. Let's get better. So... For the foreseeable future, uh, for the foreseeable future, anytime you've got like a grade, look at the comments. You know, look at the comments, go back to your blog post, make changes, go back to the assignment, resubmit, we'll do a regrade. Okay? And if you're doing that right, it ought to go up every time. Uh, I don't have any problem, you know, uh, with everybody doing well as long as everybody just makes the effort. So I'm not, you know, there's no like curve where, where some percentage has to fail or something like that. Um, and then the other thing too, just as a reminder with, uh, with Tim and Devin, uh, as I've said before, they're good writers. They are not English majors. They are under my tutelage. And so ultimately, I mean, if you want to kick in with, you know, with one of them or whatever to, to double check or, you know, follow up with, uh, you know, feedback or, or what an issue might be or whatever, that's cool. If you want to just hit me directly, also cool. And for all three of us, you know, our, our only real motivation is um, just figure it out, get it right. We don't, you know, we're not protecting ourselves. We just want to make it right by you. Um, so that's kind of it. I think that's probably enough said about that. Uh, I did, uh, Devin, did I miss anything? that I should have talked about? No, I think that's it. Okay. All right. So I want to go back. To, so unless anyone's got anything, anybody have any other housekeeping? I have a question. Yeah, Erica. Um, I was a minute late, so I might have missed it. But um, for the book posts, <clears throat> how long did you want those to be? So the book posts, basically they can just be longer than a smallish post. The smallish post is supposed to oh, be God. one paragraph, right? One thought yeah. built to one conclusion. The the longer the uh, the book inspired posts, you know, they could be two, they could be three, they could be five, probably not more than five. You know, and it's really about exploring a little bit more of a of a subject. It's an opportunity to just write a little longer. Perfect. And Thanks. Yeah, yeah. We're not being super persnickety, you know. Uh, you know what I mean? The whatever the five hundred word essay and high school or whatever where you're counting all the words and we don't want to play that game we want to we want it to be long enough to express a thought really really well so okay we ready so i realized we got like crap in terms of our our uh moving through cringely i was looking back on how far did we get on that you know it's like uh <laughs> not great but we're gonna go we're gonna go so we started actually, so Devin's got it queued up and um, I think it worked pretty well last time until I get myself a, a Windows machine where I don't have the stupid sound problem. Um, we did actually, so Devin, can you like move forward? There's a part where there's like a bunch of, um, I don't even know, like panels with lights. We went past that. Yeah, these guys keep going. Keep going. There's was. Did we have these guys? Did we do these? Like, you know, we all. I don't remember. Well, why don't we just go back to Crin? Why don't we just go? Keep going a little more, Devin. He invented a computer language. They were the results. Did you did we do this part where Jobs talks about how exhilarating it was to be ten, and then the computer would go and did we did did does that ring a bell? Oh, 
Okay. Sorry, I uh, I accidentally hung it up and came back. Devin. But it's uh, that's the end of the video right here at seven twenty two. I can't go any further. Okay. Well, let's just go back to to five minute mark then, and and let Cringely walk us through. This goes about ben, two minutes. Then a U.S. Navy captain named. Do you want me to uh, go ahead? Yeah, and go play back it? to the five minute mark, which I'm 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 regretting second guessing myself in the first place. Yeah, let's just go from five minutes. Okay. Then a U.S. Navy captain named Grace Hopper solved the problem. She invented a computer language, English words that the computer itself could translate into binary code. Now users could type whole lists of instructions into a computer rather than flipping those damn switches. Like most things having to do with computers, that first language had a silly name, COBOL. It was followed by other languages like Fortran and BASIC, and they all made computing just a bit more user-friendly. So when some nerd tells you he's been up all night programming or writing software or hacking code, what he really means is he's been typing long lists of instructions into his computer. Mainframe computers were far from personal. They sat in big air-conditioned rooms at insurance companies, phone companies, and the bank, and their main function was to get us confused with some other guy named Cringely, who was a deadbeat and had a criminal record. Eventually, you see the of punch cards, did right? begin to appear in some schools, but most of us paid no attention. But there was usually one kid who did pay attention, falling in love with the digital purity of those ones and zeros. He was the nerd. And I took this book home that described the PDP-8 computer, and it just, ah, oh, it was just like um, a Bible to me. I mean, all these things that, for some reason, I'd fall in love with. Like, you might fall in love with Devin, let's um, pause a for card a second. game called Magic, or you might fall in love with... So, can anybody else not hear the video besides John? I hear it fine. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, look, in, you gotta look on Devin's screen to get the audio coming through. Um, is that what we did last time? Just just made sure that you had to look, watch Devin's stream? Yep. Okay. Then make sure, of course, you don't have his stream muted. If you do, it's, well, that's, you know, <laughs> yeah. not going to exactly fly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. We're good. Thank you. Thanks for making sure we're all on the same page. Okay, go ahead, Devin. Puzzles or something else, or playing a musical instrument... I fell in love with these little descriptions of computers on their inside. And it was a little mathematics. I could work out some problems on paper and solve it and see how it's done. And I could come up with my own solutions and feel good in, inside. So you would keyboard these commands in, and then you would wait for a while, and then the thing would go da 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 and it would tell you something out. But even with that, it was still remarkable, especially for a 10-year-old, that you could write a program in BASIC, let's say, or Fortran, and actually, this machine would sort of take your idea and it would, tr it would sort of execute your idea and give you back some results. And if they were the results that you predicted, your program really worked, it was an incredibly thrilling experience. Nerds wanted their own computers right from the beginning, but it took a technological breakthrough to make that possible. All right, yeah, that's the end of that, this clip. Um, uh, just, and again, what, when we have the little stops here, um, please, you know, either jump in if you want to make a comment ben. verbally, uh, you know, on audio, if you want to just drop a comment in the chat um, from a, just from a participation perspective. Cool thing about this setting, actually, with online is we can actually get a lot more interactive, uh, concurrent stuff going down. Uh, than we would in a classroom setting where, you know, we don't have all that concurrent uh, text chat going on. So so please feel free to share like that. Um, and then uh, barring the audio, inter you know, uh, interrupts, uh, I'm going to just share a couple quick things. But I want to just, I remember being, a, you know, 12. And again, weirdly in the early 70s in Iowa in the middle of nothing but corn, and I was doing little stupid little programs in BASIC, you know, for the HP, uh, there was that HP 1000 timeshare system 
that that all the schools were were able to get on. Um, but uh, one of the other things when when there's that the pictures of the big. Um, I don't. I don't think there was a. I don't think there was a swipe at computer operators being deadbeats. Oh no no. They were talking about like some other deadbeat who hadn't paid his bills. The computer's job was to get you confused with some other cringely who was a deadbeat, etc. Right. That's kind of back in the day. There were a lot more um, computer system errors where you'd get like a, a wrong bill and crap like that. Those kinds of core system errors. It was everything was being rolled kind of from scratch and those mistakes were a lot more uh a lot more pervasive um <clears throat> but that notion of of the mainframe computer so i remember uh when i was 17 i went to byu for one semester i was not ready for college by any remote stretch of the imagination but i remember that on that main floor of the talmage building over at byu there was a mainframe computer and, and I remember even, even as a teenager going to the University of Northern Iowa, and it was always behind glass. And there was a big thing and you could like come and we were like 14 or whatever. And we'd be like, oh, you know, you do that thing. And there were these guys with always guys. They were always wearing white lab coats. And I don't know why that was the uniform of the mainframe computer priesthood or something. You had to have the white lab coat. And, you know, that, that idea, you just have to understand the context and the timing of the idea of what the world was like at the time, you know? It, 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 it's hard to really put that into context. Um, and by the way, was this the end of where we got? I'm just still, my problem is I watched the whole thing before, um... And it just feels like we ought to be further ahead. I don't know, but we'll find out. But please, if you're like remembering that we that we did this, um, you know, please, 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 please let me know. But we had this game. We had this in my, I just remember in high school, again, it's the 70s. It's a, it's a high school so, so small that we didn't have calculus classes. The, the most advanced math class you could take when I was in high school, in my high school, in Iowa <clears throat> was trig. That was the most advanced you could get with, with uh, math. And, uh, but I remember there was a calculator there and it had these like, it had vacuum tube, it like an LED, only it wasn't an LED, it was vacuum tubes. The light had like different colored, different shaped filaments. And it would literally light up the filament that looked like a zero or the filament that looked like a one. It was crazy, but there were these like a vacuum tube lights in this thing. And we used to play this game on it. And we had, it had a game that was a moon lander. And basically you had to start, you know, like doing deceleration and stuff as you were landing on the moon. And then it would show you like the, the where you were, altitude, things like that. And then at a certain point, if you crashed, then it would just like go to a negative number and then just stop that was when you crashed, you know, it was like such intense math nerd stuff. Um, is that really what they are? Yes. 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 That was them. That's what we had. Thank you. I swear. <laughs> that's what it was. Just having a flashback, man. Oh, that's from a movie. Well, that's from my life. That's from high school math for me. Um, but just, just understand the world at that time a lot of times, uh, it's like appreciating music, you know, like some of you, some of you appreciate the Beatles, for example. And I say, you know, blessed are you for understanding and appreciating the Beatles. But some people are like, well, yeah, I don't know. They're not so good. You have got to understand what the world was like when they, it's all just, you take it for granted because you look backwards and you're like, you know, Sandra, seriously? You're literally building a clock out of those. That's amazing. Okay, that that is just nerd points, my friend. Uh, huge, huge. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, I actually saw that movie, Tomorrowland. Um, okay, no, but um, where was I going? Uh, what was that? I got distracted by the comments coming, come rolling by. Um, 
What was the... Uh, well, yeah, it's all your fault, man. Oh, the Beatles, thank you. Yeah, if you were there at the time and you understood what was on the radio and it was Neil Sedaka and Paul Anka and rock and roll was Buddy Holly, you know, this was the world and then the Beatles show up and in 10 years really just transform all of rock and roll and kind of give birth to the, the, the epitome of classic rock, which was the 70s, basically. You can't, you have to understand what the world was to really fully appreciate. That's all I'm trying to say. And it's really the same with, with computers, personal computers. It's very, very difficult to, to get that context. Okay, let's go, Devin, let's go to, um, to video three, just, just at the beginning. This one goes to like the, the minute and 48 mark. Also, by the way, he's talking about computers in the introductory languages. Grace Hopper, um, which we talked about a little bit, right, as being hired by uh, Eckert and Mockley, you know, just the, the convergence of these people who were revolutionary. Um, and in programming languages, you know, of course, Grace Hopper just is in this, you know, epic hero position relative to, you know, transforming the way we think about programming languages and what the goal was. So, okay, so we're, we're now going to get to the introduction of the microprocessor, okay? Um, all right, yeah, you got that, uh, Devin? Yeah, it's ready. All right, yeah, let that, rock, uh, let that launch. Shit, the chip, the microprocessor. This is what allows you to have a mainframe computer on your desk. In the 1950s, mainframes were as big as this garage, and that's because they were filled with thousands of these vacuum tubes or valves. Eventually, the valves were made much smaller and replaced with transistors. Still too big, however, to make a computer that could fit on your desk. What that took was further miniaturization. Here we have a single piece of silicon etched with thousands of transistors. This microprocessor thousands holds more than a million transistors. transistors. And that's the secret of the personal computer. And that's why they call it Silicon Valley, not Computer Valley. These are the people who invented the microprocessor, Intel. Intel was started 28 years ago by a handful of guys after a row with their old boss. Their microprocessors today power 85% of the world's computers. Intel not only invented the chip, they are responsible for the laid-back Silicon Valley working style. Everyone was on a first-name basis. There were no reserved parking places, no offices, only cubicles. It's still true today. Here's the chairman's cubicle. Knock, knock. Yeah. I, I've knocked on the door, but there's yeah. no door. <laughs> Gordon Moore is one of the Intel this founders is more of worth Moore's $3 law. billion. Dollars. With guy. money like that, I'd have a door. In a business like this, uh, the people with the power are the ones that have the understanding of what's going on, not necessarily the ones on top. It's very important that those people that have the knowledge uh, are the ones that make the decisions. So uh, we set up something where everyone who had the knowledge had an equal say in what was going on. Are we at 148? Intel's Devin? microprocessors kept getting more powerful. Are we? Yeah, oh. we're at 150. Okay, yeah, 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 let's pause. I just want to say a couple quick things. Um, one is, uh, you, again, you have to understand the, the environment at this time in kind of... Uh, uh, business world, uh, you know, in the history of business. Back at, in those days, um, there was a real um, hierarchical approach to business, right? The bosses knew what the answers were. Everybody down the ladder, it was like this diminishing intelligence. And, I'm, and, and what, what Intel basically did was recognize that that was in fact not actually true. It was never really true, right? But companies acted like it, like you got your marching orders from the boss and the boss told you what to do. And then the, the middle managers told the line workers what to do. And then, you know, and then everybody was sort of like, I look at it as that kind of a, of a management structure is essentially it makes the productivity of the entire organization big O of the boss. And if your entire bandwidth, produ you know, productive, creative bandwidth is big O of the boss, you're screwed in any company, really, because the reality is there's so much. What Intel understood 
was that there was so much intelligence, so much, uh, you know, kind of innovation and, and know-how because these were all engineers, that, you know, that had kind of come out of, you know, Shockley, Fairchild, um, and they just understood that the brain trust was down in the trenches and that upper management would do really, really well to listen to those people instead of, you know, but they really flipped the, the whole business and management ethic kind of on its head. And they did a number of things that were radical that were intended to sort of flip that. One of those was no doors and the, the cubicle open office plan, okay? I want to talk about that for just a minute because it turns out to be a horrible idea. The, eth the, the, the According to Dr. K, um, according to, you know, in terms of its effect on flipping the ethic, great. The other thing they did was, I don't know if Intel did this, but I knew that it was chic in the 80s for sure, was to have like company directories that were organized alphabetically by first name, right? Where everybody was on a first name basis all the way up. There wasn't that, you know, Mr. Moore, oh, Mr. Moore, back in the 50s and the 60s, the generation that the Intel people, the, the Fairchild Semiconductor people, you know, the people that launched the semiconductor industry in Silicon Valley, there was very much a, you know, yes, Mr. Jones, yes, Mr. Smith, you know, kind of an ethic. You, you did not refer to your boss by, by, you know, his first name. And yet it was mostly him, right? And it was mostly first name. And that was the ethic. And Intel was one of the pioneers to try to flip all that, you know. So I give a ton of credit to Intel. But the open cubicle, and right, and so Eric, yeah, it, it led to... That's like a permanent change. No, actually, Franklin, these people, well, the, these people that invented the semiconductor industry were not hippies. Just why I, you can go look, look these people up, okay? They were, they were white shirt and tie, you know, uh, look, these, look these guys up. But th what happened with the open floor plan, so I strongly recommend you read Peopleware, Peopleware by DeMarco and Lister. I'm putting it in the comments. Um, it's Tom DeMarco and Timothy Lister. It is on my, I, it's certainly in my top five software engineering books of all time. It's probably in my top uh, 20 or 30 books relating to the field of software of all time. And it's probably in my top 100 books of any genre. That's how valuable Peopleware is to me. It is, it is transformative. And um, anyway, but they talk a lot about the open floor plan and why it sucks. And one of the things is flow. You cannot get into flow. It's just constant noise. You have to throw your headset on. You know, there's just, it's kind of a feeling like you're working in a fishbowl um, if you've ever done that. And um, Microsoft, in fact, deliberately did, I don't know if they've changed or evolved over the years, but they deliberately did more doors. And I, again, I don't know what other companies like right now are doing. A lot of, they've gone to more like small, uh, 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 little zones, right? With with maybe five people in an enclosed space, whiteboard, collaborative space, things like that. But flow is still critical, critical. And, and people were talks a lot about that. But I just want to say, hooray for the egalitarian ethic. It really was transformative. I think, I think in general. Um, yeah, right away to Trevor. Um, you just mentioned that you know uh, open all the offices is all the offices are open except for execs. What they did at Novell when I was there, which I actually liked, was there was like a win, you know row of windows, and you could have a cube that was on the window, or and then there was like a little hallway, and then kind of like uh, uh, offices that was kind of like a, that that uh, portable that material whatever it was with a with a sky space at the top. So you could have a door with indirect light or a cube with a straight out the window view. And then you could kind of choose. And when I, I really like that. Some people are just fine in the cube, you know. So um, 
So, by the way, Tyler, this, this book, you, Tyler was recommending Deep Work, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World. I presume that that is potentially really applicable. And we got a, we got a second witness from Trevor on that one. Is that? Yeah, he talks about how to do any real valuable work. You have to be focused um, and that the lack of... The, all the little distractions that come from notifications and emails, yeah. really low productivity. Interesting. So in other words, with all the, with all the, the things we've got going on, uh, it's all, you might as well be in a cube even when you're in your home office, right? Because it's a constant ding, email, text message, Facebook, Discord, right? Something constant stuff. It is a battle. Could, would Tyler or Trevor... Um, would either of you be willing to jump on the Google Doc, the shared Google Doc? And yeah, thank you, Tyler, to add that. Um, that looks amazing. Uh, and I'm making... Do I... Okay, sorry. I'm having a flashback. I think I might already have it. I'll look it up while we roll the next video. So let's go. Um, Devin, just from where you are... But go to the three minute and four second mark, okay? They soon had enough horsepower to run a whole computer. Only Intel didn't appreciate the brilliance of their own product, seeing it as useful mainly for calculators or traffic lights. Intel had all the elements necessary to invent the PC business, but they just didn't get it. Lucky for us, someone did. This is the chip that launched the personal computer revolution. Actually, Devin, can you pause for a sec? I just, I just want to say one other thing about this right here. Do you see the orders of ignorance at play right there? They're, they're, so, they're so locked into a mindset. And later on in this thing, uh, uh, Jobs is going to talk about going to Xerox Park and seeing a demo of graphic user interface um, Ethernet, object-oriented programming, and basically how Xerox could have owned the computer industry and that they were just a bunch of copier heads and they just could not see it. And it's really the same idea, this idea that Intel could have owned the whole thing, right? Um, just understand, it's really about the orders of ignorance. You don't know what you don't know, right? There's no framework to know about all of that because you're so entrenched in this thing. That's good if, you know, I mean, they've done okay, you know, but I'm just saying it's just an illustration of the orders of ignorance. Okay, all right, yeah, let's keep going until 304. This is the magazine that announced it. In January 1975, featured on the cover was the world's first personal computer, the Altair 8800. You look pretty. It was the crazy idea of an ex-Air Force officer from Georgia, Ed Roberts. If you look at it, you know, it was kind of a grandiose, uh, almost megalomaniac uh, kind of scheme, you know. Uh, and right now, I couldn't do it because I could see right off there's no way you could do this. There isn't any way you could do this. But at that time, you know, we just lacked the, uh, the benefits of age and experience. We didn't know we couldn't do it. Yeah, I like that. We lacked the benefit of age and experience. We didn't know we couldn't do it. I like that a lot. There's a lot to be said. Again, there's a conventional wisdom that just gets in the frickin' way sometimes. It's, it's a form of, it's almost like an anti-pattern of the orders of ignorance, right? Remember, you have to create a framework. The framework allows you, right, to, to generate new questions. This is, I think, an example of, and the same with Intel, it's almost like a negative framework that locks you into a, an inability to ask certain questions, right? It's like a, it's like the framework of the orders of ignorance. What is it? It's like negative third order ignorance. I like that. I just made that up. Do, do you think, right? Negative third order ignorance, which is a framework that restricts your ability to ask the interesting questions that you also don't know the answer to, you know, et cetera. Well, it's more like, more like a second negative, negative second order ignorance, right? Cause that's where you generate the the, the questions, but you create, um, yeah, the bee, the bee can't fly, exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, let's keep going. Let's keep going, Devin. And let's go to 429 is the next stop point. 
20 years after Ed Roberts' flash of brilliance, this exhibit is... Sorry, if I click anywhere on the wet... The chip. We have confidence in you. <laughs> I mean, I do. I don't know how everybody else feels. Yeah, it's when if, <laughs> if if I click anywhere below the video, it closes out of the video, so I have to like not touch my mouse. Sorry. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry, man. Twenty years after Ed Roberts' flash of brilliance, this exhibit is being held to celebrate the anniversary of the Altair. Like every other PC pioneer. Ed built his computer just because he wanted one to play with. There were some of us that lusted after computers, really, at that time. All the computers in the world tended to be in big centers, and you had to get permission to get close to them. And it was, a, you know, you just nobody could, nobody had access to computers then. And the idea that you could have your own computer and do whatever you wanted to with it, whenever you wanted to, was fantastic. And where was all this happening? It was far from Silicon Valley, Intel, or IBM. Out in the desert near the airport in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Ed Roberts ran a calculator company called MITS. Having an ugly building wasn't its only problem. MITS was going bankrupt. Nobody was buying calculators, and Ed needed $65,000 just to stay afloat. And we went to the bank and had a late night meeting, and the issue was whether we closed MITS down or, or kept, or they loaned us an additional 65000 and I was asked how many machines that I think we would sell in the next uh, in the next year after it was introduced. And I said 800. It was considered a wild-eyed optimist at that. Within a month after it was introduced, we were getting 250 orders a day. Started about six. The Altair wasn't even a computer. It was a computer kit. Whoa! This is a pretty well-equipped machine. You had to build it yourself, and even then, it usually didn't work. Still, the demand was amazing. And there were actually people that came to MITS, a couple people with camper trailers and camped out in the parking lot waiting for their machine. I mean, they were so eager. I mean, I think everybody had sort of daydreamed or Walter Mitty about owning a computer. The surprise was that it would be possible for the average college student, for example, who was living on bare subsistence to actually buy a computer. This is what really amazed me was Is that the mark, Devin? I think it's actually further than the mark. It's five twelve. Okay. Yeah. No. It's okay. All right. That's all right. Um, yeah. So what I wanted to say about again and again, I'm kind of dropping my comments. You know, doing the the old the old man wisdom thing. You know, or, or just simply old man rambling about the past. Um, but but as you have your own experiences, please jump in and you know both. I mean, there's a lot of the decent amount of of chat uh, traffic, but but do feel free to jump in, Kay, on the audio. But um, this idea, this is the dawn of the, of the personal computer industry, that Altair with the flip of the switch. If you look at it, it's literally got eight switches. Why? Eight bits for a byte, right? Put it where you want, click it, and that would enter that into memory. Okay, so you could program it. Running, what was it, an 8088, I think, that was inside the thing, which was an eight-bit processor by Intel, right? But again, as a, as a lesson about startups and entrepreneurship, I think just about every company I've ever heard of has gone through a moment like that. We had to go to the bank, we had to get $65,000 or we had to close the doors. There's, you know, there's like Jan Newman said, you know, it, it's luck. Everybody else said, right? Jobs said, it. you know, we, we got lucky. And, and Waz said we got lucky and Bill Gates says they got lucky. Um, but everybody that has a successful company has some moment where you're just, you know, you're just like the plane is like skimming the treetops and, and could have gone at that moment, could have just, you know, dove straight to the ground and that would have been the end of it. Um, you know, so yeah, so back, so Tyler, yes, it's like, like when we go to the, like in 2810, right, when we're doing the LC3 and we're doing it, um, within machine language, right? So imagine eight bit instructions, machine language, that is how you program the thing. There was none of this fancy assembly language crap. These young kids, you know, 
This was the days when, you know, we didn't even, you know, we only had ones and zeros. Like literally we only had ones and zeros. We didn't even always have ones. It was so difficult. You can't even imagine. Um, so let me see. Uh, yeah, I want to, uh, man, I got a, that last comment about the orders of ignorance. Um, I don't know if a narrow or fixed mindset is an order of ignorance. That's why I was saying it was like a negative order of ignorance. It's like a different pattern. You know, if so, if orders of ignorance are based on open mindedness, being willing to stumble onto new things and explore willful rejection, but it's not even willful. It's actually non-willful. It's like sub, it's like unconscious rejection. Sub, it's not even entering in. It's like the blocking of the questions. I don't mean I see your question and I reject it. It's like you were saying a question and I didn't even perceive it to me. I think there's kind of like a negative. It's like negative orders of ignorance. Ne I don't even know what you would call that. Orders of something dumb. I don't even know. Orders of dumb. I don't know what we call that. But um, okay. So yeah. So the other one is they said, well, how much do you think you could do? And he's like, we think we do We could do 800 a year. And then real quickly, they're doing 250 orders a day. It's one of those things, again, where uh, this is everybody's faking it till they make it. Startup land and business is a lot of guesswork, a lot of taking your best crack at it. And then maybe you're wrong or maybe you're right, which is just crazy, 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 crazy. Okay, let's keep going, Devin. Let's go to the end of this one. That people were so... There was a sort of a pent-up demand for having your own computer. And if it could be that cheap, what a wonderful thing. This is an Altair computer, the first personal computer. And not just any Altair. This is Altair serial number two, the second one made. The first Altair made was sent off to be photographed at a magazine and was lost in the mail. So this is the oldest personal computer in the world. Lost in the mail. Pretty historic junk. But the question is, what do you do with it? I mean, it, it has a front panel with switches that you can click back and forth and some lights. But in the back, there's no place to connect a keyboard. There's no place to connect a monitor. There's no place to connect a printer. In fact, there's practically nothing at all that you can really do with this thing. But back then, 1975, the people who had it were thrilled. All right. Again, just context. That's all. So let's jump to, uh, let's go um, to the next one, uh, number four, Devin. And go to the uh, one minute and seven second mark, uh, mark which, which gets us to the homebrew computer club and as soon as you got that just so yeah just just do like that minute um this is 1975 it's insane i'm 15 years old when this homebrew computer club was doing its thing uh you want to let that roll Devin? the very uselessness of the altitude Sorry, uh, till what time again? Uh, 107. Oh, uh, until when? 107. Oh, that's the end, not the beginning. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start at zero, go to one minute and seven. Okay. The nerds formed clubs to talk about their new toy. One of the first was the Homebrew Computer Club, which met on Wednesday evenings in a hall rented from Stanford University in Silicon Valley. Presiding over near anarchy was Lee Felsenstein, who pretended to be in charge. I would start the meeting by making a horrendous loud noise because everyone was talking and I had to get some attention somehow. And I would use it to call on the person in question. I'd make threatening gestures with it. Most of us were in the electronics industry to a certain extent. There was also a stratum of physicians. And there were a lot of radio amateurs, for instance, finding a new technology that wasn't stale. But most of us were at a sort of middle level downwards. We saw ourselves as crazed, ignored geniuses, or possibly geniuses, but at least we could each hope to get our hands on a computer of our own. No, no, not machine. <laughs> 
The very it... uselessness of the Altair is what drove the hobbyists together. Yeah, okay. Um, and then let's jump over to 312, Devin, for the next start of clip. How are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Yeah, and then just go, yeah, just let this run to the end. Unless I scream stop at you or something. Turning the Altair into a useful tool required a programming language so users could type their programs in rather than flipping switches. There's cringely what programming it was and a machine language. Of some big computer language like BASIC, only modified for the PC. This was called a BASIC interpreter, but it didn't yet exist because the experts all thought that not even BASIC was BASIC enough to fit inside the tiny Altair memory. Yet again, the experts were wrong. At the end. All right, let's yeah, go. Let's yeah, let's end. go to number five, and then start at um, start at a minute ten. So one thing about Homebrew Computer Club, Homebrew launched in March of 1975. The Altair appeared on the cover of Popular Electronics in January of 1975. Just think about that for a second. The Altair shows up on a magazine in January and two months later, the Homebrew Computer Club launches. This was a pent up, this was a pent up need. Okay, let's go to, let's go to buck, tw uh, buck 10 and we're gonna go to 252, okay? Company that would be needing software. And he said, okay, well, we, we gotta call, call these guys up and see if this thing is for real. We realized that things were starting to happen. And just because we'd had a vision for a long time of where this chip could go, what it could mean, uh, that didn't mean the industry was gonna wait for us while I stayed and, and finished my degree. Oh, wait, another Harvard so dropout. Called up and, you know, we told him, we, we, we've got this basic and it's just, you know, for your machine, it's, you know, it's, it's not that far from being done. And we'd like to come out and show it to you. So we created this basic interpreter. Paul took the paper tape uh, and and flew out. In fact, the night before, he he got some sleep while I double-checked everything to make sure that we had uh, had it all right. But I had no idea what it was really going to be like to, to try to run the software. It had never been run on, a, on an actual uh, computer before. He was very nervous about whether this would actually work. And he got to the office, and we all gathered around, and he put the, his fingers on the switches and he uh, loaded basic in with paper tape into the Altair. And I was just, I was so nervous. I just, this is just, not, it's not gonna work. Not gonna, it worked. And it came up and it could do a few little simple things. And it was amazing when Paul called me up and said the thing had worked the first time. And of course it was incredibly fast. And it printed out memory size. And, and I think Bill said, well, it printed something. <laughs> so I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was, that was unbelievable. The fact that it really worked <clears throat> uh, was, was a, was a breakthrough. Maybe there wouldn't be a Microsoft if it hadn't, if the screen hadn't come alive, who knows, it might all be quite different. Is that, are we, is that the 252? Did you, did yep. you listen to the last thing? What's that guy's name? Bunnell, what's his name? You listened to the last thing that guy said, that maybe if the screen had not come up, maybe there wouldn't be a Microsoft. That, that is the thin, thin thread of history, right? Just picture it too. You know, you're like college guys. You get on an airplane, you fly, you're at Harvard, you're in Massachusetts, in Boston. You fly to Albuquerque with paper tape and you've, by the way, I used to have a bunch of programs in basic on paper tape. Sometime, I don't even know when, I threw them away cause dumb. You know what I mean? In the moment, you're just like, ah, you know, I don't need, I'm never going to use this. But I actually did have paper tape. Um, it was literally just a roll, like, you know, the little things you get at Chuck E. Cheese, you know? Just a roll of tape, only instead of tear off tickets, it was just like, like a holler with punch card, just with just hole patterns. That was it. You didn't miss much. But, um, you fly, you burn the airfare, you fly to Albuquerque. Um, 
And then that's the first time you ever run it is when you're doing your demo to this company that you're going to try to sell software for. The other thing that you don't, that, that's hard, that's kind of lost a little bit. And then, by the way, Devin, we're queuing up at 524 for the next, uh, for the next little clip. But um, what you have to understand, too, is that Microsoft launched. So I, I said in the middle of it, you know, another Harvard dropout, right? So Bill Gates is an undergrad at Harvard, just like what's his bucket? Um, who's our guy? I just think of him as data. Um, who's our guy? Facebook guy. Why am I blanking on Facebook guy? Uh, but that guy also was a, was Zuckerberg? a Zuckerberg. Thank you, Zuckerberg. Why was I blanking Zuckerberg? Um, data. I don't know, right? Um, but he was another Harvard undergrad who dropped out, right, to become a billionaire. Uh, super brilliant and then also got lucky, right? When Gates, when they built... Um, when they built that basic interpreter for the Altair, uh, that launched them. We think of Microsoft as Windows. Well, what do you think of Microsoft as? I think of them as, there you go, Windows and DOS. That's what I think of Microsoft, right? Today. Or what do you think of Microsoft as today? The Zune? Microsoft Office. Oh, yeah, duh. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Word, right. Office. Word, PowerPoint, Excel. Absolutely. Applications, right? Um, and Teams, right? And Windows, right? And then, but really, the big, big beachhead was DOS. But you have to understand that Microsoft started in the languages business. It started with building basic. They were just guys doing their thing, and Gates was programming, and they were... I don't know what his undergrad was. Might have been computer science for all I know. Might have been math, but he was a programmer. And uh, they, the Microsoft's big entry, and we'll get into it later on in the history of Cringely, is how they accidentally, again, accidentally stumbled into the operating systems business. And they only did it because they didn't want to lose the languages business. They made the deal with DOS because they didn't want to possibly afford missing the languages business. And everything, you know, everything you did with, with software back in those days was Microsoft. Microsoft Assembler, the Macro Assembler, Microsoft C, Microsoft COBOL, Microsoft Fortran, Microsoft Compilers. That was, that was the thing. So, um, okay. But man, the thin threads of history and boom, snap, it flows differently. Would it be somebody else? Mm, probably, but not the same, you know? But it's not inevitable before the fact or when you're in the middle of it. And there's also a lot of great companies that have that same moment. The thread snaps and they're dead and the company never sees the light of day. That's, that's a real thing. Okay, let's go, um, Devin. So you're at 524, right? Um, we go to 652, and then that's it for this for this clip. Wild time. So Here comes the guy who solved the problem. 20 years after finishing the first microcomputer basic. Software, hardware, application stuff. Exciting time. And the, the first user convention where we got people to come in and tell us what they were doing, what they were excited about, and other companies like Processor Technology or MSI or Comemco got going as add-on companies. These companies are long forgotten, but they were the, the humble beginnings of the, of the PC industry. Left in the hands of those early hobbyists, the PC might have never made it to the shopping mall. Reaching the wider market required a different type of vision. Enter the flower children of California, who thought the PC was, well, groovy. Are we in the right chunk, Devin? The safety of secret committees. Yeah, yeah. I thought so, but actually. So it should be between 524 and 652 of number, was, of number five? Um, yeah, that was, yeah. 
I'll, I'll go back to it. But I mean, That's were we I... were we in the middle of it? And yeah. I, and I interrupted Franklin's comment about hippies because he knew there were hippies. There were hippies involved, Franklin. I'm not arguing that. There were hippies like that. Guy. Yeah, it's, and it's until six what again? Six fifty two. Yeah, this is this is what it is. Okay, all right, just, thanks. Okay. No problem. I just get triggered by was. the '60s music. You know what I mean? Because I lived it, and it wasn't as great <laughs> as it looks. You know, in the movies. <laughs> well, groovy. From the safety of secret committees, they talk about the danger of war. Remember that the 60s happened in the early 70s, right? So we have to remember that. And that's sort of when I came of age. So I saw a lot of this. And to me, the spark of that was that there was something beyond sort of what you see every day. Far from the smell of the gun. It's the same thing that causes people to want to be poets instead of bankers. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think that that same spirit can be put into products. And those products can be manufactured and given to people, and they can sense that spirit. To help you understand yeah, Pause here. This, I don't want to see that guy take his clothes take off. off. My... Yeah. They get in the hot tub. <laughs> it's, not, it's not graphic, but just fat boy, no thank you. Um, anyway, yeah, you can go ahead and go to number five, so I don't even have to look at that guy's uh, uh, man boobs, whatever that is. I don't want to see it. Um, but no, what I want to show, what I want to just say about Gates versus Jobs, they were friends in the end. They had some ups and downs. Um, there's a part in this cringely interview where Jobs says, you know, I don't, um, I don't deny Microsoft their success. They've earned their success. And then he goes, for the most part. What I resent or what I, what I dislike is just that they have no taste. Their products have no taste. And um, anyway, Andy Hertzfeld tells, then tells a story about um, Bill Gates when he saw the Cringely interview where, where Jobs said that Microsoft had no taste. He like literally calls Steve Jobs on his cell phone because I guess when you're Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, you have each other's cell phones. And he just calls him up, you know, and Jobs goes and, and Gates is like, you, why do you, you know, you, you said that my, uh, he's like, I know I don't have any taste, but my, to, to impugn my entire company, you know, and, and, and then Jobs goes, I shouldn't have said it, Bill. I, you're right. I should not have said it. I'm sorry. It's true, but I shouldn't have said it, right? But what you have is both of these people um, are really driven. They were really driven to win, okay? Really, really driven to succeed at a kind of a psychotic level. Um, both incredibly brilliant, but Gates was absolutely the programmer, coder, technician, um, technologist and Gates and, and Jobs was the product visionary, which is why at the end of the day, Jobs was not a poser. He was the real deal. Uh, I mean, he was an a-hole, but I'm, you know, during a big stretch of his life anyway. But um, it comes down to, uh, well, you, you, you threw me with that Jobs was a poser thing, Devin. <clears throat> he was a poser technologically, yes. Yeah, in my in my opinion, I think he really was. Um, I've got. I feel like I got. A, I feel like I got a hot mic with typing or something going down. It's distracting. If somebody can check your mics, um, yeah, fair enough. But no, anyway, um, what did I want to say? But Microsoft, especially with DOS, they built like you know what was their market? DOS. Uh, programming languages, right? And then it was business apps like Word and, you know, and Windows. And, you know, they made the Zune and Apple makes the iPod and launches this revolution, you know? And that, that product sense comes from Jobs. And you can really see that in the contrast between them, well, like what they talk about, what they talk about. Um, and again... Here, and I, you know what? I'm going to take this break 
to again pitch this book, the Steve Jobs biography by Walter Isaacson. It is an amazing read. And now if you really can't stomach uh, Jobs, then maybe it's not your book. Um, I wanted to also, I was going to do this last time, and I want to, since I'm on a slight break, Microsoft and Apple did have a business relationship that was symbiotic. Um, this book, Walter Isaacson, Innovators, I think I showed this to you last time. I recommend it. I think it's in our list. I want to just give you a couple others that relate to this space. If you want to understand um, how these companies show up, these companies show up not because of a force of history. They don't show up because of a societal movement. They don't, they show up because there's this person, this person shows up with this driving ego. Could be two people, right? Like Sergey and Larry who start Google, right? It could be Jeff Bezos. It could be Zuckerberg, could be Bill Gates, could be, you know, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, but Gates was the driving force. Um, there was a there was a point early in the in the process um, of launching Microsoft when Bill Gates said to Paul Allen, Paul Allen was quite a bit older and Gates was like 18. And I think it was I, I it was Gates who actually said to Paul Allen, if we're gonna make this work, I'm gonna need to be in charge. You know? <laughs> I mean, there was just this drive that was a little bit crazy. And these people, like I said, Bezos, Zuckerberg, the modern, the modern group, but you're going to see that over and over and over again, okay? Um, and that's why, here's a couple other books that I would recommend. This one is much more expensive because it's kind of a, uh, a Springer, Springer Verlog, but this book is called um, Software Pioneers. And it is a collection that's about people that contributed to the field of software engineering. So if you're intrigued in the research aspects, you know, there are crazy, crazy figures um, in here. For example, um, uh, Nicolas Wirt, Pascal, Fred Brooks, uh, The Mythical Man Month and the OS 360, Alan Kay, The Graphical User Interface, Dijkstra, which you've probably heard about, Dave Parnas, Modularization, uh, Michael Jackson, not that Michael Jackson, Structured Programmer, so, Structured Programming, Tom DeMarco, uh, Michael Fagan, Inspections, Barry Beam, Eric Gamma, Design Patterns. I mean, there's like, there is, from the software perspective, I recommend this thing. Here's just some others that I, I love reading the bios of people. This one is going to come a little bit out of left field. This is the biography of uh, Larry H. Miller, who built the uh, formerly the Delta Center, now the uh, Advertiser of the Year uh, arena, whatever they're, you know what I mean? It seems to be moving around. Larry H. Miller, crazy freaking brilliant guy who was innovative and driven it's amazing. It's amazing, actually, if you want to read that um, from a business perspective. Do you understand that that modern movie, con the conception of modern movie theaters with with uh, uh, arena, what do they call it? Um, stadium seating and certain things were actually invented by Larry H. Miller uh, in the megaplexes. Okay, here we go. Charles Lindbergh. That guy was a freak. Another great Chuck. Another famous Charles, okay? This is an amazing read. Do you know that the night before he flew across the Atlantic by himself from New York to Paris, that he had flown the previous night from St. Louis to New York by himself with the plane? So he'd actually been up. He wasn't just up for like 24 or 30, whatever. He was up for 24 more than that before that crazy incredible and then this one somebody mentioned it somebody mentioned it already i'm not talking about disney the company but walt disney the man this is basically the steve jobs of the 50s this guy was the steve jobs i have two different bios of walt disney i recommend them both 
Um, and it's my opinion that Jobs and Disney are like historical Siamese twins. Just, you know, there's a thread. It's remarkable when you read about Disney, the persistence, the perseverance, the unwillingness to just put up with like corporate and business and banking crap. You know, they'd be like, he'd do a movie and whatever. The movie had like a bunch of monkeys and they'd be like, more monkeys. And, and Disney was like, no, we're not the monkey studio. So we did a movie, it had monkeys. It was very successful. Now we're going to do a different thing. It's not going to have monkeys in it, you know, and it was also successful. And they would be like, more talking birds. You know, the, it's like the Hollywood studios or whatever. And, uh, and Walt Disney, before he launched Disneyland, took one of his kids, a couple of his kids, they did a cross-country trip and he visited every single amusement park in America and spent like a couple days at every amusement park in America at the time and made notes and figured out like what sucked and what didn't suck. And from a design perspective, amazing. Okay, and then one more that I just want to point out because I was talking to another student about it and I realized that it's really, really great the book is by Thomas Friedman called The World is Flat. Now, this is my, there's a third edition. This is second edition. And so I actually have a third edition coming so I can just read it because it's just worth a reread. This book is phenomenal to just deal with. It's called A Brief History of the 21st Century, which I love the title, considering I think this was released in like 05. Yeah, 05. Um strongly recommend The World is Flat about the global economy, um, but also about technology, about infrastructure, internet infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Amazing book. All right, that's my quick tour to books. Now I can put these all back on my shelf, but I wanted to share those with you before I forgot. Okay, Devin, where are we? Where are we? Oh yeah, number six. Let's go to the very beginning and do the first uh, minute and 12 seconds. <clears throat> Out of this creative show and tell came Apple Computer, the first mass market PC company. The Apple founders, a couple of recent graduates from Homestead High, were regulars at homebrew meetings. Steve Wozniak was the technical wizard, and Steve Jobs was the visionary who saw microcomputers as a possible business. The first Apple Computer was primitive. It was cobbled together by Woz to impress his friends at the homebrew meetings. Everybody was interested in computers, so I started getting a crowd around me because even though I was too shy to raise my hand and say anything in a club meeting, after the club meetings, I would put my, my computer that I had built, and every week it had a little bit more working on it, too. But I would set it down and let people type on the keyboard. I would explain what's in it. If they come up to me and ask a question, I can answer. Um, you know, nowadays, I would have the ability to tell them what it is, you know, and be a little bit more promotional, but back then I could only answer questions that they asked me. But I got a group that started gathering around me. And Steve Jobs saw that I had a lot of interest around me at the club, and he said, let's start selling it. And uh, let's make this company. Came up with the name like Apple, that. and, uh, and uh, that's how it started. Steve Jobs said, let's start selling it. Actually, let's keep, let's keep going to, to 1 minute 50, Devin. Apple was at best a funky company, started by a couple of teenage hackers who previously had been working as Alice in Wonderland characters in a local shopping mall. And they started it in this garage right here. The first Apple computer was built here. Now there are more than 10 million in use around the world. And I was there, well, for a short time, I was an employee at Apple Computer, employee number 12, and one day I helped move materials out of this garage. At the time, Steve Jobs said the company was short of loot, so he offered to pay me in company shares, but I held out for the money. My mother still reminds me of that incident. All right. The Apple is that, One. Is that 150? Or one, yeah, 150. Yeah, the, uh, Jobs said the company was short on loot, so Cringely, Cringely was employee number 12 at Apple. Should have taken the stock. Should have sat on it till today. He'd be a freaking, I don't know what he'd be. He'd be a something there. Um, again, again, right people, right time, right? Like we talked about bands. Um, 
be aware of those moments when they when they when they happen to you, right? One, so you, I don't know if, if you've like wondered why are we why are we talking about all this history, right? It's almost October and we haven't really done some of the other interesting topics which we're going to get to. I swear it. Um, why are we talking about all the history? You know, it was it was Santayana who said right that that not understanding history, you're doomed to repeat it. I guess that meant the negative part of it, I presume. But there's also, you know, I think there's a flip side of that, which is not understanding history means that you're doomed to not repeat the good parts of it because you didn't, you didn't look back. You don't, you don't have a context, right? You, you just sort of only know what this little pod, this little tiny little world, if you're not understanding, you know, the historical flow of things, you know, on a, on a lot of levels, you're, you're kind of missing out. And so what's, what's interesting is, you know, some of you, if you can just look back and see some of this, there's context. There's like a, like borrowed maturity, right? It's, I think, I think of it as that, like borrowed maturity. Um, but that's why we read. That's why we study history. That's why we try to understand what other people went through, you know, so that hopefully, ideally, when you're in a position uh, to have whatever, some buddies want to, want to build a company or you get hired into some startup or you start to do whatever you're going to do, you're, you have a, a level of con, uh, context that follows with you in terms of, of those opportunities. And, and one other thing that I think is kind of interesting, when I... When I, my, the first startup company I was involved with was 1986. And I remember being really interested in doing startups in the, in the 80s. So I was in my mid-20s. I was 26, right? And um, I remember at the time there were already like 10 word processors. Word was not one of them. Uh, we were kind of like, wow, you know, what, else, what, what can you do? What else can you do? You know? And we were like, well, maybe the market's already saturated with whatever. And, and we're looking back now, it's like five seconds after the Big Bang. And I'm sitting there, but your, your perspective is always necessarily limited. You can't avoid that. You can't get around that, right? So what I'm trying to do is, is, is make sure we have a chance to talk about the history so you understand the serendipity that goes into where these opportunities hit, which means you've got to be willing and, and comfortable potentially moving around, changing jobs, understanding where you fit best, where you're happiest, right? You know, and it's not going to be the same as the next person in terms of what makes you happy. They want, they want the mothership. You want the startup with all the risk, right? And the other one is just the, the fact that you can't look into the future, right? I, I came, you know, I've had two different times where I've been with companies where I've had stock where depending upon some literally on a thin thread, you know, it, it made the difference between adequate millions to retire at that moment um, or not, and then just kind of move on and just keep kind of living life, go get the next job. One of those was Novell, um, which if we had not acquired WordPerfect, right, I woke up broke the next morning uh, <clears throat> after you know, sitting on a half million dollars in stock and I'm 32 and it's 1992. Um, and the other one was with the startup company in Oregon, which was acquired and then that company went public. And, you know, depending upon certain flow of events, you know, that could have been a big thing. And then it turns out, you know, I, I, I pulled enough to pay for my PhD, you know, to... to to pay back what I pulled out of my world to pay for my PhD, break even, move on to the next thing, which happened to be academia, right? Uh, and just, just understand that, that those, those threads for me could have flipped very easily and I wouldn't be here, right? I'd be, I don't know what I'd be doing. I'd probably be full-time uh, mall Santa, which I think I can pull that off. I got to slide these down a little bit but I think you got the idea. Um, the other thing is networking with people. I just want to end, I want to end on this one. Um, networking with people. Number one, 
it's never been easier because of LinkedIn. Back in the day, we had Rolodexes. Crazy piece of paper right on it. Put it in your little Rolodex, flip through it. That's what we had. LinkedIn today is like a massive Rolodex. Use it. Um, you don't have to be a big schmoozmeister, but every time you meet somebody in a business setting where you met them enough where in the 60s you might have exchanged business cards, which we don't do anymore, you would add them on LinkedIn. You'd build that network, okay? And also understand that there are people you're in this class with, maybe, not, I don't know, now it's probably less less face-to-face -face contact, but, but there are people that you meet in your undergrad at UVU that are, um, you're going to work with them five years from now, or maybe 10 years from now, or maybe 20 years from now, or 40 years from now, because, you know, hopefully you'll still be alive and productive 40 years from now. I'm just saying that that network starts right now and grow the networking it is a big, big skill. When it's time for you to like, oh, I'm, we're hiring somebody. Who was that one guy? I don't remember, you know, who was that one girl? I don't remember what her name was. You know, she was amazing. And then you're like, okay, well, well, no, no, no. You add these great people on LinkedIn. Then you just start flipping through your LinkedIn connections and go, boom, that's her. And then you get on the phone and you, you know, I've had the call that I wasn't able to heed. Hey, Chuck, you want to come, you know, how about coming here? And maybe you take it, maybe you don't. Um, <clears throat> but that network becomes huge. The other thing that's huge about that network is it actually starts like right now for better or worse, but also for worse. If you're like a punk in your classes and you're the one that lets your team down, that network also goes with you, right? I mean, if you suck, if you suck, the, your classmates don't just vanish away from you, okay? Especially if you want to stick around, you know, the Wasatch Front, which is a massive software market. And so you can make a great, you know, most of you are locals or, you know, some, somewhere Utah connection kind of local, right? Um, no, there's nothing wrong, Michelle, with being an introvert. Well, it depends on what we're talking about. The in, for the introvert, LinkedIn's even better, even better. Because you just add them on LinkedIn. Now you have a connection to them. You don't have to go up to them, introduce yourself, give them a business card, call them to maintain your Rolodex. No, it's actually never been easier, Michelle, for an introvert to maintain contact. Then when someone's hiring, they're like, I remember Michelle, or I remember, you know, whoever. And, you know, she was amazing. And it's time to go do some hiring. You're, if you're connected on LinkedIn, you're in their network. They can draw on you to come get you a job. Okay. But, the, but if you're the one who sucked, you were the one on the team project that just bails out, right? And, you know, and you bailed out and left your team hanging. Then five years later, you're walking into some place to interview and then you see one of the people from that team who is going to be like, you know, hopefully respectful, but then they're going to say to the hiring manager, nah, you don't, nah, that guy's not reliable. You don't want to hire that guy. You know, in other words, the network starts right now where you build relationships you, you show how good you are. You show what you can do, you know. So, yeah, anyway, we can talk about, yeah, LinkedIn didn't do squat. Um, well, it depends on what that means. That kind of says, that's kind of large, that's kind of um, strong language. LinkedIn didn't do squat to help you get your current job. Uh, it depends on what you mean by that as to whether I would take any issue about that. Wait, Deli's husband uses business cards? That's so cute. That's cute. Yeah, nobody, yeah. The point is that is not that you get your job via LinkedIn. Just that LinkedIn, it's not just about getting a job. It's about maintaining connections because you don't know what's going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now. It's about maintaining a connection and networking. So anyway, we're, over, we're out of time. We're on, we're on time. We started on time. We're going to end on time-ish. Oh, I just want to say, uh, the pig, the man and the pig, that is in honor of the uh, presidential debate tonight. That is what I feel about national politics. <laughs> to me, that's all this is. And I just have to say one other thing for those of you that are interested. We're done with the technical portion of our program. But I just want to say this. Uh, four years ago, 
you know, I couldn't, I couldn't really think of either candidate without throwing up in the back of my throat, you know? Um, and it was rough and I didn't, I didn't, uh, watch a single debate for you. And I'm a political junkie from a long, from childhood. I'm a political junkie. I didn't watch a single debate. The gag reflex was so steep. So then you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But now four years later, you're like, you got, you're going to watch this. Yes, I'm going to watch this because that guy right there and the pig. I cannot, I can't look away. This is a train wreck in slow motion. This is like a fail video waiting to happen. And I can't not be there. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that. I am watching out of just macabre evil intent for how screwed we are. That's where I'm at. There, that's my political statement of the semester until, although we're going to be here through November, aren't we? Yeah, I'll have to temper. Um, and then I got to decide who I'm writing in. That's where I'm at right now. So anyway, hey, uh, that's it. I got to pop me some popcorn and be ready in 10 minutes. Thanks, Franklin, for the fail video. <laughs> that's tonight, man. That's tonight. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That is tonight. Thank you, Franklin. Yeah, time to play a drinking game, <laughs> Eric. Oh. Yeah, Eric, I'm throwing away my vote with you, man. I'm throwing it away. That's where I'm at right now. It is just a train wreck. It's all a train wreck. Everybody is dumb, and I'm out. That's where I'm at. But I have to watch. I have to watch. So anyway, hey, take care. I hope this is... I hope Cringely's... We got a little more Cringely to go. Um... But I hope it's been good so far and would, you know, I would vote for the Grease Pig. Yes. Sam, do you got a bingo card for the debate tonight? You will share that with us, right? Would you, will, I'm dead serious. I am serious as a heart attack. Xander, if you would share the, the bingo card with us, I would just love it. Would you be willing to consider doing that? We need the bingo card. Post the bingo card. The highlight of the lecture. Okay, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna roll out of here. I'm gonna kill the YouTube feed, but uh, stay safe. Uh, have some um, Pepto, uh, you know, on standby. Some Alka Seltzer or something to get you through. Some alcoholic beverage. Some <laughs> something to get you through this thing. But uh, anyway. Take care. I'll f I don't know what I'm doing on Thursday, but it's probably what's on the schedule. But I don't know yet. We'll figure it out. Okay. 